This week on the podcast, we were delighted to be joined by Jonathan Shu. Jonathan is a co-founder of Tribe Capital, one of the first data-driven VC funds in the world. In this episode, we went everywhere. We discussed Jonathan's background in physics, the invention of data science, his time as a partner at Social Capital, and the building of Tribe. We will learn so much from this conversation, and it's not one to be missed. Enjoy. We are super excited to announce that you'll be joined on this episode by our first sponsor, Recess, the furniture startup. So Recess sells everything you need for your home and office, and they've sent us one of their products, which is their office chair, and oh my God, it is the most comfortable thing I've ever sat in. I'm actually really jealous of Sachin because I had a feel in it and it is incredibly comfortable. It makes you more productive and I'm stuck on this chair, which is about to break at any minute. Recess has helped thousands of Aussie startups, including the likes of Eucalyptus, Afterwork and Leica. They also have enterprise customers such as Mervac. How you feel when you're working really matters for your productivity and just for your health as well. So if you want to get fitted out with some furniture, whether it's an ergonomic chair or a soundproof box, let us know. We've got discounts for B2C customers for 20%. And if you're a B2B customer, let us know and we'll sort you out. And we didn't want to tell you this because it's not peer reviewed yet. But ever since I've sat in this chair, it's increased my productivity by 300%. And we're live. Hello and welcome back to the Satcham and Adam show. So today we're talking to one of the great investors all the way from San Francisco, but we are delighted to join by one of the co-founders of uh, Tribe Capital, Jonathan Chu. Yeah, we're talking to Jonathan today and we've had on the Malcolm Turnbulls of the world on our podcast. We've had on the founders of the biggest VC funds in Australia, some of the biggest startups that are now unicorns in Australia. But looking at Jonathan's background, I think he is up for contention for being the most sort of accomplished guest that we've ever had on. So looking at Jonathan's LinkedIn, he's done a whole lot of things that at first glance, maybe they don't make a whole lot of sense together. He is a PhD at Stanford in physics. He's been a founder selling a company to Facebook. He's been a data scientist. He's been a partner at Social Capital, which um, as a lot of people know, quite a few famous people at the time worked there. And he's also been a venture investor and founder um, at Tribe Capital, which is now a data-driven VC that has multiple billions of dollars of assets under management. So thanks a lot for coming on, Jonathan. And I think we're going to have more than we can um, sort of, uh, we're going to have a lot to talk about today. Sounds good. Happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Thanks. So in sort of like looking at your background, it looks like there's been so many different threads of thought and sort of threads of action. As, as I mentioned, being a founder, a data scientist, and a venture investor, what is the sort of thing that has connected all these actions together? Or what has been the thing that has sort of driven your career today? Yeah, yeah. I guess I'd say there's kind of like a couple a couple of things. Um, on the one hand, there is clearly this threat of data, right? Um, you know, I think you alluded to some of it there that, you know, um, when I joined Facebook, I was kind of one of the first roughly five-ish data scientists at Facebook in 2009. And at that era, before that, I had actually already been doing some data work um, at another company, the one that actually acquired my previous company. It was a company called Slide that was a, a social gaming company in San Francisco run by Max Lebchin, who's a, the founder of PayPal and a firm. Um, in between, he ran this social gaming company that had acquired my company at the time. Um, and, you know, data back then was really early. You know, it was sort of, I think of it as like the big data, big bang, right? Sort of 2009, 2010, eight, maybe 2008, roughly, it was sort of very early in the era in which a company could have a whole lot of data to work with. And so what ended up happening is there was this sort of gold rush of tech companies hiring PhDs to dig around in data to see what they could, what sense they could make of it. You know, and I was sort of one of those PhDs. And, um, and, you know, in the end, you know, we ended up calling it data science, right? Like that was the term that emerged out of that. It wasn't there at the beginning in 06, 07, when we were starting to do this stuff. And, you know, we, we ended up developing sort of, not just me, but, but really across the overall ecosystem, many different techniques of utilizing that data to just develop insight into companies, develop insight into businesses, developing insight into, into patterns of behavior. And I should point out, it's not even something that's really unique specifically to tech companies, right? If you look at academic economics, right, the whole field of economics kind of went through its, a data revolution, a not dissimilar data revolution, sort of in the 2000s and, and, and such. So, you know, it, it really happened across the entire sort of ecosystem at large. Um, you know, and, and clearly part of my story was doing that, right? Um, you know, doing it within companies, 
Um, and then obviously, you know, doing it within venture capital at social capital and our tribe. Um, so, so that's an important piece of it to make sense of the data. Um, you know, my, my particular background, quantitative background there was, was certainly oriented in that way. You mentioned I have a PhD in physics, which is, you know, I think of that as sort of the physics is like the, the greatest quantitative model that humans have built in some sense, right? It's like a, it's like an amazing model. If you think about it, like, uh, we can, you know, you throw a ball and you can model where the ball is going to be with amazing precision <laughs> using physics. Right. Um, and then there are things that go on in sort of subatomic, uh, particle physics that are even more precise. Um, you know, most other sciences are nowhere close to that precise, right? If you're in sort of biology or chemistry, you're good to a couple significant figures, but in physics, you're down to, you know, many, many, many significant figures. And so, you know, after working on a model like that, there's sort of a desire to, to figure out what are the models that, that work, you know, um, when it comes to running a business or maybe, you know, driving adoption of some product or some feature. So that was, a, that was really the thread that we were chasing, you know, um, throughout the social web using data. I'd say that's one of the big, big drivers. The other driver is really trying to do something that other people weren't doing. You know, to be clear, when I went into technology, the drive was more to be a PM, right? Like uh, my first job out of graduate school was actually as a PM at Microsoft. Um, and, you know, when I came to Silicon Valley after Microsoft, you know, that was sort of the more the orientation, go be a PM. But there was this weird thing, you know, this weird data thing that was going on that didn't really have a title. Um, and the fact that nobody was doing it was sort of attractive to me right um because no one was doing it and then you know that whole story roughly played itself out again when i left facebook in 2014 um i was kind of interested in doing data you know in venture because no one was doing it to be clear when i left data at facebook the very obvious thing to do would have been to just go to whatever airbnb uber those were the companies of the era and certainly you know there was interest in in having me join them but for me that would have just been the same thing right whereas doing doing it in this in this, uh, you know, sort of venue of data science or in the venue of venture capital was completely un, you know, sort of more or less untouched in 2014, which was sort of the motivation. So those are the two bits, right? Like figuring out data, figuring out how, what it means to apply quantitative methods to this stuff, and then doing it in a, you know, in a sector of the economy and a segment of the ecosystem where it, it wasn't already happening in some sense. That's that fascinating. A very answer, and, and, and I think the way you spoke <laughs> that answer, you could see how structured your thinking is. And um, I, I love hearing people like that um, think. But Jonathan, going a little bit further back, you mentioned that you had this kind of desire to do something a little bit different. Um, where did that come from? Where, did you have a family that encouraged kind of risk-seeking behavior early on? Or was this something that was a result of studying at Stanford and being around kind of great entrepreneurs? No, not at all. Actually, the family background is much more conservative, right? Like my 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 dad, like um, you know, his family fled China during the Cultural Revolution, and after doing so, the desire was to do something super stable. My dad worked at a bank, uh, World Savings and Loan, which was subsequently eaten up by Wachovia um, um, in in the financial crisis, in the Great Financial Crisis. So so the desire was always to be to be really um, to be really conservative. I think that my my own my own sense, you know, tell you the truth, it came out of insecurity. I didn't think I was a very good software engineer. I saw these guys who were real software engineers and I was like, mm, I can't do that. <laughs> There's no way I can ever be, you know, great at that. Maybe I could be passively good, but then over time I knew that I would not be good at it, right? Um, come, you know, just because they keep getting better at it. And so it was more about finding white space just so that, you know, it's, it's sort of a blue ocean, red ocean thing, right? The blue ocean, red ocean thing, people usually talk about that in terms of business competitiveness, right? Start your business in a blue ocean where you don't have to fight. But it's also true at a personal level. Right. Like if you, you know, if you, you know, if you, if you go to do some, if you go to play a game that everybody else is playing, well, it's kind of a red ocean by definition, right. Versus doing something that nobody really does. Incidentally, one of my hobbies on the side. Um, so, so I, I, you know, in addition to this, you know, I, I've actually been a performing jazz musician for over wow. 20 years of my life. I'm a long time jazz guitarist um, since I was young. And um and uh, in some sense, that's actually a bit of a theme for me, because if you think about something like classical music, right, when people like are brought up young and they're like, oh, play classical music, and it's just about who can play this better, right? There's sort of a score of music in front of you. And it's really who can, first of all, can you even play it at all? Most people can't. And then if you're one of the five or 10 people who can play it, who plays it best, right? It's very linear, right? Um, 
it's kind of like weightlifting. Who's the best weightlifter? It's the person who lifts the most weight, <laughs> right? Whereas in jazz, it's not like that, right? Jazz is like chaos. It's kind of like, well, if somebody played it that way, you absolutely cannot play it that way because to do it, that would be a complete disservice to yourself, to the art form. They've already done it, right? It's already done. So you have to find space where nobody's done anything before. And that's kind of the history of jazz, right? It's like, uh, it's, the, it's the history of people finding un, you know, sort of unexplored space. Um, so that, for me, musically, creatively, that's kind of where I came from. Um, and that's always been a part of me. And then it actually, incidentally, subconsciously, I think, you know, sort of affected my professional decisions. Mm. And sort of looking into your background, obviously, you did the PhD at Stanford, and you've sort of already alluded to that a lot of your life and career was a bit more of a random walk, you didn't so much plan to be a sort of a data driven venture investor. Um, and you obviously had this love for being data driven and looking at models early on. But I'm really interested in like, this is super unique having a PhD in physics and then being in the sort of startup um, and venture world. How did that sort of inform your approach to investing later on? And like maybe even more simply, just what did you get out of doing a PhD in physics? Yeah, first of all, it's not that unique. If you look in the history of physics, you'll you'll see this interesting thing, right? The, the earliest computer scientists were all physicists, right? They were not computer scientists <laughs> because they had to invent this thing that was computer science. And then subsequently there were computer scientists, right? Or they were kind of mathematician physicists, right? It was actually the same way in quantitative hedge funds in the 90s. Um, you know, there was sort of a group of these people who started figuring out, oh, you could like make an algorithm roughly to trade, right? And those, uh, those people who were figuring that out, most of them were physicists, physicists and mathematicians, right? And then, you know, for my particular generation, I just happened to be sort of in this era that coincided with that big data, big bang in the social web, right? It turns out it's not just me, right? To be clear, there's about, in my in my graduating physics class at Stanford, it's, just, you know, the class of 2006 PhDs, there are literally three of us who were all, who all became like kind of tech people, right? And sort of quote unquote pioneers in doing this, you know, uh, my, my good friend, Jonathan Goldman, um, you know, um, was like the first data scientist at LinkedIn. Right. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you know, um, and uh, so, so there were there was him, um, you know, there was also um, let's see. So uh, Ke is Kevin, Kevin Weil uh, was uh, was one year before us. And then he was at Twitter. He was like the first data guy at Twitter. Right. And then he's now runs his own VC. So there were kind of a few of us, you know, a few of us kicking around. And it was more I, I think it's more about sort of when there is a bit of a dislocation something that opens up technology wise, where there's like a bit of data or a bit of something that can be structured quantitatively, who are the people who are going to do it? They're going to be people, you know, I think that maybe I should say physicists have been historically good at it because they're kind of like willing to go into it when there's nothing, there's no model for it. There's no data science as a degree program. There were no, you know, there, you know, if you go back to the beginning of computation, there were no computer scientists, you know, when the when the people did quantitative hedge funds in the 90s, there was no such thing as a quantitative trader. They were the first people. They were just physicists trying to trade, <laughs> right? It was only later that they started making whatever graduate courses out of it. And so I think that's what it is, right? There's sort of, I think it's a combination of like the structure of thinking, the quant the ability to be quantitatively flexible. I think there's an there's an aspect of physicists, which is that we're willing to be um quantitatively sloppy. Okay, like, I don't know how much time you guys have spent with like academic computer science people, they want to like prove things to you and like physicists just don't care. <laughs> All right, we're, we're more like, oh, this, this kind of just works. And then the other piece of it is that physicists on their own have terrible career prospects. So there's this natural desire to go try to find some way of just making a living. <laughs> and, you know, that's kind of what happens. <laughs> Yeah, and I've heard that for a lot of the PhDs now, you actually have to teach yourself data science anyway to to write your PhD. So then people will transition over, um, which is an interesting pipeline. That's actually that's a bit of a of an artifact of the current era, right? Because remember, mm -hmm. I said that there was a big data big bang, right? If you yeah. go back into 2000, 2008, if you go into the nineties, there wasn't a lot of data, right? The reason why is because the compu the the like technology was such that it was expensive to store and compute on a lot of data, and then yeah. all of a sudden in the mid two thousand, it became cheap, and so everybody has data and it's not just tech companies, but it's also academics, right? So all of a sudden academics went from having no data to a lot. And so all of a sudden there's a bunch of very rapid discovery of how to use these data techniques across all these social science fields, across all of these different fields in academia. And that's kind of been playing out now for 10, 15 years, right? Mm. Uh, but to be clear, I don't know if that lasts forever, right? Because it's like when there's, a, when there's sort of a jump in the technological capability, everybody takes advantage of it very quickly, right? Yeah. But then, 
<laughs> you kind of exhaust it, right? Um, and then people have to figure out what the next uh, what the next frontier is. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. And, and we're going to go into onto investing in a second. But one more question about the personal and you. What's a common misconception that people have about you? Oh, I think one, it's not really about me, but I would say that like one thing we get a lot is that people think because we're data people that we must invest in a lot of data companies. And they send us a lot of companies that are like, ah, oh, here's the data analytics company or a company that does dashboard XYZ Tableau something or other. But we tend to actually stay away from those companies. If people look at the companies that we have invested in, they tend to not be that at all. Um, and so, you know, it's, the, it's, the, it's, the, it's a difference between like, you know, looking at the world a certain way, that's one thing, but then there's a whole separate thing, which is investing in tools that enable one to look at the world that way. That's a totally different thing in some sense, right? Yeah, that, that's a really interesting one. And we'll get into the sort of specifics about social capital and tribe in a moment. But I think a question that was like really on Satch and, and I's mind is that venture investing, especially at the growth stage, it can be quite quantitative. You've got a lot of data to work with and you can be quite rational, so to speak. But there's also obviously a lot of sort of emotion, um, somewhat maybe irrationality or qualitative analysis that you're going to be doing in venture, understanding a sort of uh, the personality and psychology of a founder, their fit for a problem and other sorts of assessments that just might not be able to sort of be calculated uh, through data. So I'm, I'm sort of interested in how you balance the rationality and the data-driven nature of the sort of physics um, and the data science that you've learned with also the uh, sort of qualitative aspects that you also need in venture. Yeah, we, we really build it in more at the firm layer, I would say. You know, to be clear, as a firm, our goal is to do this data work and to really help as many founders as possible with that data work, even if we're not investing. You know, right now we really try to do it around 400 times a year where we try to give back really quantitative, you know, benchmark, hard benchmarks with really good feedback to the founder, even if we're not investing, because we do not invest in 400 companies a year, right? So that's really the key. The key for us is to give that value back to the ecosystem, build that goodwill. And then every now and then we see one that's really interesting, right? And then we to be honest, turn into kind of traditional venture investors at that point. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, we know the data is all there. Now what? And then we start talking about all the things you're talking about, right? The founder obviously matters. Obviously the, the market matters. Obviously the team matters. Obviously all of that matters. But, you know, for us, we do that data stuff up front because it's part of how we give value to the ecosystem, right? The goal there is for us to just give the value away so that, so that people want to work with us. Right. That, remember that venture, a lot of it is access, right? Like how do you, yeah. how do you get the access? And, and most people get the access by being, you know, nice people and networking a lot. And that is totally fine, you know, but we try to go one step further to really give something tangible. Right. So Jonathan, really so your, hard. your first assessment on the company is based on how they perform those benchmarks. And then you decide whether it looks interesting to do some further work. Well, actually, first we have a conversation, yeah. right? And the conversation is really there to make sure that if, to see if we can even do the data work, because as you can imagine, as you know, most companies are pre-product. There's not really data to look at, but there's a whole lot of companies that have data, right? And it's a very large, much larger number than you would call growth stage companies, right? When we say growth stage companies, we tend to think 20 million in revenue, but a lot happens between zero and 20, to be clear, <laughs> a lot. And there's a lot of data that's, dig that, that's floating around in there. So almost all of, most of our time is spent more in that one to five to 10 range of revenue where there's a lot of data to be clear, but it is not a growth stage company, right? It's, it's still, um, it still has those early stage risks, right? Um, and the data is not the only thing, right? When the thing, when the company gets up to sort of north of 20 to 30, $40 million of revenue, you know, you're buying a real business, right? Like that's a real business whose equity you're valuing. When you're dealing with a company, you know, that has no revenue, you're kind of buying a team and an idea, maybe a prototype that has no proof points, right? Um, but in, in the middle, right, like a few million dollars of revenue, you're kind of in both camps at once, right? And that's kind of what makes the middle interesting, right? Is that no, no one thing dominates. Is it all team? No, because sometimes the, the pattern of product market fit is strong enough to overwhelm the team. Well, is it all data? No, because sometimes the team can overwhelm the data, right? And, and that's that's what makes this middle part interesting is it doesn't it doesn't lend itself super well to just raw simplification, right? Um, you know, which which is why like we have an approach to doing to investing in this part of the stack, but we don't believe it's the only one. You know, totally, I think you could do a totally fine job investing in this part of the stack without doing any data. I think you could do that, right? It's not what we choose to do. <laughs> it's not, that's not the product that we're trying to build. It's not the value we try to give to the ecosystem. 
before we start to sort of run away with talking about tribe and the thesis of tribe which is super interesting you got your start in investing at social capital um and i'm really interested in what some of those key takeaways were um, as you worked in social capital yeah yeah so social capital really what we were trying to do so so what the context for that was that you know when i left facebook in 2014 um Facebook for the sort of preceding roughly six years, seven years had really been on the cutting edge of sort of developing what we consider data science now, right? Like back in 07, 08, nobody was doing it at all, but Facebook was kind of on the edge, kind of making stuff up, right? And then through that, that time period, you know, by the time I left, there were like hundreds of data scientists at Facebook, right? Like I had a hundred of them reporting to me, right? And so we had really gone from like not using it at all to figuring out how to use it. And when I say use it, I don't just mean like the obvious stuff is build it into the product. Yeah, the product uses data, but the not obvious stuff is like corporate development. You know, how do we like make strategic decisions? If we have like different feature sets that we could theoretically use, how do we make the pro how do we inform the product level decision discussion using the data? So it was a lot more than just like ad ranking, which is definitely a piece of it, but there's a lot more of this softer corporate, you know, product thinking that we had figured out. And that was actually what the bulk of that work was, right? And so after having done all that, the question was, you know, in social capital, well, how do we bring this to bear in venture, right? Because venture at that time was almost none of this, right? Um, and we tried a bunch of different things, right? We really basically tried everything, right? The, there was sort of one mode, which was, you know, scrape data from the internet and then build models to tell us who to talk to, sourcing, right? Um, and you see that there's a lot of that now. And that was okay, you know, to be clear. I think that for us, that was never uh, the, the, the leading order strategy. And I, the reason why is because the partners at Social Capital were already longtime venture investors. They already saw a lot of companies, right? And if you talk to somebody who's been a VC for like 10 years and you say, what's your biggest regret? They never say, well, I wish I saw that company seven years ago. What they say is, I saw that company seven years ago and I messed it up, Right. When you work with somebody who's been in venture for a long time, they already see a lot of stuff, more than enough stuff. Sure, they don't see everything, but they see more than enough stuff to make a really great return if they make good decisions, right? And so for us at Social Capital, if we build a bunch of data to help with sourcing, it was kind of marginal because of the quality of the existing investors, right? Now, to be clear, if they were not great existing investors with shorter track records, maybe it would have made sense to do the sourcing thing. But for us, it just never made sense, right? And so that, that set of strategies kind of, you know, was de-emphasized. And what we really ended up doing was, you know, figuring out, okay, we had developed these frameworks for thinking about growth and, you know, at Facebook, um, we didn't use the term product market fit as much at Facebook, but that's really the term in some sense, you know, growth adoption. And the question turned into how do we adapt those, you know, to, to other business models, things that were not social web, right? How do we adopt it to SaaS businesses, payments businesses, sharing economy businesses? And so how do we adapt it and then use those insights both to just to help entrepreneurs, you know, because if you're a founder, you know, this is like 2015 era founder, it was very helpful to have somebody be like, hey, we developed these models at Facebook. This is what they look like. Here's what I think it means for you. And, it, you know, give them something, a new way of thinking about their business, a new way of quantifying their business. So that was, that was the initial sort of idea. It was like, yeah. oh, I can just I can share those models in some sense. And so we did that for about four years, um, you know, didn't really build much software, any software really to, to, to capture it. But at least that sort of entry level bit of philosophy was kind of was what we figured out there. Jonathan, I'm curious when you're building these models, obviously venture it takes 10 years to know if you're any good or not. How do you test how good these models are into without kind of having that um th that time frame? Yeah. Yeah. So I use this analogy, right? Um, so I like to say, you know, we when we when we think about data science, we really think about it as sort of the philosophical um heir to accounting. Right. Yeah. Accounting has been going on forever, <laughs> hundreds of years, maybe even a thousand or so, if you, if, depending on how you define accounting. Um, and if you look in the whole history of accounting, right, like people didn't really use it to like speculate on equity until about a hundred years ago. Right. That's really what Benjamin Graham did. Benjamin Graham, in some sense, you can interpret his work as saying, uh, you know, I have a view as to where value comes from. You know, I think I can recognize it using this analytical technique that these bean counters use. They call it accounting. <laughs> and it is in like the early 1920s or early 1910s. And lo and behold, he was the only, you know, it worked. Nobody else was doing it, right? And that kind of became the basis of fundamental analysis, which is now the basis of, that's sort of the, the lingua franca of, of investors worldwide now, right? He was kind of the first person to use data, <laughs> right? He was just using accounting, right? Um, 
And, you know, when you fast forward sort of to today, you know, it's kind of the same. We have a view as to where value comes from. We believe it comes from product market fit, growth, and we use those analytical techniques that the bean counters, data scientists, were using to recognize it, right? So that's, that's really how we think about it. So if you use that framework and you ask yourself this question, how do you know if it works? Well, that's like asking the question, how do you know accounting works? Does accounting predict the future? No, that's not the purpose of accounting, right? The purpose of accounting is not to predict the future, right? It gives you a, a quantitative analytical lens to understand the current state of the world. You can extrapolate it many different ways, depending on the type of business and depending on the type of person that you are, you may come to different conclusions about how useful it is for predicting the future, modeling the future. But, you know, its ability to model the future doesn't, doesn't reduce its utility, right? Its usefulness is sort of separate from its forecasting nature. Does that make sense? Yeah. And it's the same way with our framework. Our frameworks aren't really about predicting the future. They're about like giving us a really clear headed way to talk about the present and the past. And then we can talk about the future using those, you know, sort of well-developed definitions and frameworks. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. And staying at like quite a high level, once you started to have a bit of success with those models, what were like some of the biggest takeaways about what product market fit actually looks like? Because obviously you're putting it in a sort of data version. And for a lot of people, it seems quite elusive. And so like, what were those takeaways about like what, what it looks and feels like in a company? Now for a quick break from the podcast. And Satch, we've been wanting to hire someone for a while, haven't we? Yeah, I can see the bags under your eyes from all the editing you've been doing. Yeah, it's getting pretty tedious to edit these podcasts week after week, but I don't really know where to start when hiring someone. Yeah, I've got a friend in the Philippines, actually, that I think would make a brilliant hire for the show, but I don't know the first thing about getting them onboarded. Yeah, see, that just like makes me nervous. It's like payroll, <laughs> insurance, all these forms that you've got to think of. Look, we're probably going to break a law if we try <laughs> to do that. <laughs> Luckily, our friends at Employment Hero have a great solution for this. They've got a new product called Global Teams, which helps you set up new employees from around the world, even when your business isn't operating in their region. Yeah, this is awesome. And you also get um, access to Global Talent Teams, which is really cool when you're trying to hire from all around the world. And it's actually um, one of our friends, Ben Thompson, who runs Employment Hero, who's been on the podcast before. So we were really stoked to partner with this such a great organization. Ben is an absolute legend. We're very keen to have a beer with him soon. But if you're having troubles hiring people around the world, I highly recommend you check out Employment Hero. Well, you know, I, I think there's this component of like understanding what, you know, it's, it's this idea of like, quote unquote, does it have product market fit, right? And people used to say, oh, you just know. If the customers just keep buying it, you just know. And I think that's kind of true at some level. That's kind of like saying, how do you know your company's profitable? You just know. Uh, but if anybody's actually done real accounting work, they know that it's not that simple, right? There's various, there's, that's why there's a difference between EBITDA, right? And, and true profit, right? Like true profit is a little bit different. And just because you're EBITDA positive, you know, it's, it's a different thing. You can use that information in a different way. And it's the same thing when we think about product market fit. There are gradations of it, right? Of what's going on. And the question is more like, can you, can you quantify it? And can you actually benchmark what you're seeing relative to other things in a true quantitative fashion? I think that's the main bit. There's this other way of thinking about it. I tend to think of it as like, you know, when you think about traditional financial statement analysis, when you look at a financial an income statement, it's arranged by time, right? There's a bunch of rows and each column is like quarter one, Q2, Q3, right? Each, time goes on the x-axis, right? But the thing is that if you think about, when you think about businesses from a startup point of view, you're not really worried about time so much as you are about acquiring customers. Right, it's more like okay, I acquired my first customer, ten, then a hundred, then a thousand, then ten thousand customers. Right, so it's more about that should be the focus, the customer. And then the question becomes: people have various ways of doing unit economics. Um, we've laid out we've laid out our approach to it. It's all written on our website. There's a big old blog post on it. As far as I can tell, nobody's really done a better job of it, articulating the way to think about unit economics in a way that really transfers to all businesses. Right. And that's kind of what it is, right? It's a systematic way of thinking about that. Thinking about that little cash cycle inside of a company that depends more on the customers versus calendar months or quarters. Yeah, I've spent about an hour reading all the articles on your website. And this is the first time in a long time I got out pen and paper and I started scribbling stuff down and um, very, very well written. Um, Jonathan, has there been any point in your time, especially with starting Tribe, that you feel like you've been over-indexed on data? Over-indexed? Yeah. I guess the thing is what... To be honest, it's not as strong of an index as you think it is. You see, I make yeah. it sound like it is, right? And, and I think that it's one of these things where we give that value to founders. But to be yeah. clear, investment process, right? Like, you know, as I mentioned, we kind of do this data work on like 400 companies a year. Yeah. That's like a lot. <laughs> Let's just be clear. That's a lot, right? 
Um, and then we end up kind of deep diving into maybe 70 or so per year. That's a lot. So that's like once a week, right? We'll yeah. be deep diving into a company. But then we only invest in like 20. So we actually spend all of our time 70 to 20. That's where we spend almost all of our time. And that little, you know, that time is, is a mixture of qualitative and quantitative. And, and the data is always part of it, but there's many other things going on. Now, from the outside world, if you're an average founder that interacts with us, you think that you, you know, your conclusion would be that Tribe spends most of its time doing data work for companies we pass on, right? Because we do 320 of them that we just pass on and we just give them out for free, <laughs> right? So like, it looks like we're really heavily indexed on data because we give away, we spend so much time making data, you know, analysis for companies we pass on, but actually internally, we spend much more time on that, that last yeah. chunk, right? Which becomes much more a mixture of effects, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of like when you actually decide to start Tribe, was this like a really sort of organic decision where you found a lot of success using this sort of data-driven model in VC, looking at product market fit at social capital, and you kept on having success. And after a time, you're like, okay, I've got to start my own VC fund. There's still like a massive sort of um, uh, opportunity here. I wouldn't say it quite that way. You know, I think that after having done it a few times and sort of played around with the model and, and developing these frameworks, we kind of had this feeling like when you look at a company through this lens, it was like kind of like taking an x-ray to a company. I think my partner Arjun, he, he said, it's like playing on God mode. <laughs> you, like, you just see right through the company. Oh, you see everything. And the idea of going to join a traditional firm and not being able to, to do that, it just didn't seem like a great idea. Like we're like, oh, we saw what the future would be. But if you go to another firm, let's say we didn't start Tribe and we all kind of went our separate ways into some other venture firms, which we, to be clear, was very much a possibility. There were many firms talking to us, you know, that wanted us to join. Um, it was just clear that it wouldn't be, that wouldn't be the thing, right? Every firm that's out there has their own story, their own way that they got successful. And it wasn't this story, which means that if we tried to bring this story individually as, you know, as individuals into each of these firms, it probably wouldn't survive, right? So it was more like, well, if we think this is the way that we should be doing investing, and we don't think we'll be able to do it somewhere else, I think we should start a firm to make it really come to life. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? It was more out of necessity because we believe that this approach, you know, was really the future. Sure, it was successful, but to be clear, true, true success in venture, you don't really know. It takes so long, right? Like the investments that we did at Social Capital, they turned out, a lot of them turned out to be really good, but like, you know, you didn't really know that <laughs> two years into the investment, <laughs> you kind of, you, you, you had a lot of leading indicators, you know, you had, you had viewpoints, but it, it, that's, that's not it in and of itself. Right. I think it's an important thing, right. It's true for all venture investors, venture investors, you know, like you don't really know success until so far in the future. So your decisions aren't, aren't made on the basis of the success because you're kind of inferring what you believe the success will be, but you don't really know what it is. Does that make sense? You have to kind of believe in the process more than the success. Yeah. Incidentally, this is something Michael Mo talks about. You guys, have you guys, have you guys read Michael Mobison's work? No. An investor is worth reading his stuff, but he, he talks about um, at one point in his career, he um, he was like, what was it, chief investment officer, I, be I believe, at Credit Suisse, and he oversaw like all these private wealth managers who were all all these traders, people who were like trading, investing their private wealth clients, and he said, oh, like how do you know? who's good at it versus who's bad. The naive answer is to say, look at their track records. Yeah, but there's a bunch of problems in that because track records are a mixture of skill and luck, right? The skill and luck come together to produce the outcome. But like, do you, if you only judge them based on the outcome, you're almost certainly gonna be picking the ones who are the luckiest and they will always revert down to the mean in the future. And so what do you do in that world? Well, you have to look at their process. You have to try to independently assess skill. With, which is largely in the absence of outcomes. It's in the absence of results, right? So he talks about this in some of his books. It's good stuff, I recommend it. <laughs> yeah, my, my sort of follow-on question to that was like, at the time you're leaving social capital, why were not more venture firms doing this quantitative approach to product market fit? Was it purely sort of because it was something that it hadn't, as you mentioned, it hadn't really been tested, so it was a risk to do this? Or was there some other reason why it was like really unappreciated? Was it because a lot of the big firms, they had their own biases? As you said, they had their own identity? Yeah, I think it's, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't want to call it biases. Everybody has a bias. We clearly have a bias, right? Everybody has a bias, right? I think it's more about the nature of, it's the nature of how, how a venture firm gets built, right? Like they, every venture firm is built by somebody who presumably had some level of success, 
according to my prior definition, some level of success doing something in, in investing and whatever it was, it certainly wasn't data oriented, right? Like all these people who, who formed these successful firms, they, they did something that looked fairly traditional and they used that, they used that to help them create a firm and they built the firm in their image. Right. And it works, presumably. Otherwise, LPs wouldn't keep giving them money. <laughs> right. Presumably it works. And so if it works, why mess with it? <laughs> right. That, that's why people don't do it, because to be clear, the vast bulk of investors who have, you know, raised several funds, they think they have success at it. They think they have something that's repeatable. I, who am I to judge whether it's repeatable or not? They have customers, LPs who think that it works. Who am I to judge that decision making? Let them make their decisions. Right. Um, and if they have something that works, there's not like a strong impetus to change it up, right? Like there's very little impetus to change it up. I'm curious. If anything, um, you risk losing LPs, right? Because you have LPs who are like, I've been behind you on the strategy. It keeps working. Give me more of the same and I will give you more money. Like, uh, you know, why would you change it? Yeah, I, I think that's a good segue into raising the first fund for Tribe. Did, did, did you think that this was more or less difficult than you initially thought? Well, we knew it would be very difficult. Um, we ended up doing our final close in May of 2020. Do you remember May of 2020? Yeah. Yeah. COVID. So I would definitely say that the last couple of months were harder than I expected because nobody, you know, started, you know, who did a first close in 2019 thought, oh yeah, I'll do the final close. And then there might be a pandemic that might intervene in my final close. So it was definitely harder than we thought. Um, there's a friend of mine who said, you know, no matter what fund you're raising, whatever size it is, you have to have like 700 LP conversations and whatever it is, you do 700 of them, you'll probably mostly get there. And sure enough, it took us about that. I remember he told me this when we were about one or 200 and I was like, oh yeah, I guess we'll see. Maybe we'll get there sooner, but no, it took like 700, you know, sort of in that ballpark. People underestimate just like how much it takes to sell these products, right? How much you have to go out there um to to sell the thing right maybe there's a few there are a few exceptions out there i think if you start your own firm your own fund and you are independently wealthy enough to stake 20 30 percent of it yourself you can make it happen much faster but to be clear like a more normal person um you know it's going to take it takes a long time so it was about what we expected but to be clear we had pretty 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 low expectations <laughs> and do you think that the the thesis of tribe was understood kind of back in back in 2019 yeah yeah the the thesis was was largely the same we just hadn't built anything yet right like we knew we we knew we had a view of the world like an analytical quantitatively driven view of the world um but it's one thing to it's kind of like it's like saying if you go back to accounting it's like saying you know how to do accounting versus you have built quickbooks those are different <laughs> Right. Or let's say, you know, I, I know accounting or I've invented accounting. That's one thing. But then it's different to have the income statements of thousands of companies like on hand. Right. Those it's different to have the framework and then to have the data that gives it full flesh. Right. And so we had the theoretical framework and it was more, more or less fleshed out, kind of kind of mostly there. Like I said, like I told you, it was mostly there from Facebook and before, to be honest. Right. Like it wasn't even just me. It's, if you just take if you randomly sample data scientists in Silicon Valley and piece together what they say about what they were doing, you would loosely come up with what, what we came up with, right? So we had the, the, the philosophical, the intellectual framework in place, and we had the promise of building it, right? We said, we will build it. And after we build it, we'll have a lot of data in it. And it's going to enable us to do this benchmark at a whole nother level, deliver the value to founders at a whole nother level. Um, and that was the story at the beginning. And then now, you know, five years later, it is now built. <laughs> We've built this giant software system that does all this crazy stuff and, and really can deliver value to, you know, to our, um, both to our founders as well as our LPs, like uh, at a level just far beyond what any of them could do themselves. And as you started Tribe, you're not just investing in companies, but now you're investing in people that are actually going to come and work for you, people that you want to invest in and hopefully stay with you for a number of years. I'm wondering if you've learned anything about identifying sort of underappreciated talent or just generally how you've, uh, how you've had your own frameworks for spotting talent for people that you want to bring on. Yeah, I guess, you know, like to be clear, I think the bulk of my managerial hiring work in my career was at as an operator, right? Like at Facebook and before, I think over my time at those two places, I hired well north of a hundred people, right? Um, whereas, you know, it's social capital and tribe. I've been involved in hiring maybe 30, 40, right? It's just much over a much longer time period, right? Um, and so, you know, comparing and contrasting the two, I'd say that, you know, when you're in an operating company, 
um, hiring for a role, software engineer, data scientist, whatever, ops analyst, whatever it is you're hiring for, um, the roles are uh, fairly constrained, right? Because that's the nature, right? You build a company, you want roles to be well-defined. And so you hire people into those roles, right? And so you can create hiring schemas that are sort of tailored to each role that you wish, right? I think one of the things when you're very early in a company, whether at an investment firm or at a startup, is like, uh, you know, sort of being open to the idea that like those roles are probably going to shift around a lot, right? The people that you hire, you maybe hire someone for this role, but the likely case that that remains the same shape for the next 12, 24 months is very low, right? So they'll probably move around. The priorities might change. People might have to move into other roles. And so there's a strong preference for sort of more generalist, flexible types, right? Versus people who like really excel at one role. Incidentally, this goes back to my thing about music, right? <laughs> you know, like I kind of have this thing when I when I give people career advice, I always tell them, you know, you know, don't don't run marathons, don't go into weightlifting, don't do these one dimensional things that are sort of be the best at that. Rather, like try to find flexibility, space in between in between the spaces, right? And and I think that at our firm, because we're still pretty small, right, thirty four people, um, we're still you know have have an interest. I think the people who have thrived the best with us. And in general, it's small companies are people who are really flexible with that, who can who can add value sort of regardless of what's being asked versus people who are like the expert software engineer. And they're just like that thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, sort of that that flexibility is kind of what what uh, what works for us. I knew that going in. Right. That's kind of why I enjoy it, because I've always preferred to be in that sort of an environment, working with people who are generalists and flexible versus being people who are with people who are just one thousand percent excelling on one thing at a time. Which to be clear, I think that it's important in our companies for them to build themselves that way, but it's just not what we do day in, day out. Yeah, there's a, a good book called Range and they talk about kind of being T-shaped and um, having kind of analogies from different spaces to draw across, which you clearly did in your career. And and Jonathan, what, what about your portfolio? What have been your favorite kind of investments that you guys have made to date? Uh, I mean, I don't know. We have so many, so many, so many good investments. I'd say that like, you know, by and large, you know, uh, you know, I'd say that like uh, when, when I look across our portfolio, right, there's just a lot of companies that have turned out really well. The things that I think that I've really enjoyed seeing are situations, um, you know, where other people have kind of overlooked it a bit. Um, yeah. Just to kind of give you one example, right, uh, we're, we're, we're pretty big investors in Docker. Docker is an old company, right? Like they've been around, uh, gosh, I, I'm, I'm going to get the number wrong here. I think like 13 years or something like that. Um, and they, they raised a whole bunch of VC in their first iteration of life and then ended up having to recap right uh, back in, I think, 2019 or 2020. Um, and then we ended up doing the round after the recap. But that's a situation where after a recap, you know, companies, they end up having a hard time, right? Because like everybody in Silicon Valley knows them. A lot of people lost a lot of money on them. So people are biased, right? With regards to how they think about the company and they're unable to look at it for what it is. You know, our data was able to really help us. Our data approach was really help us. It was able to it enabled us to really understand the value separate from the baggage. To be clear, the baggage is real, right? It's like, oh, this thing has been through a lot, but there's some really good stuff here. And to be able to sort of do that, you know, weigh, weigh, the, weigh both sides of that really rationally and get to the point where we invested in it, it's turned out really well. But, um, you know, I, I like those kinds of stories, right? Because other people had overlooked it. And, and it's not, and it's overlooked it. And it's not that they overlooked, they invested in it, to be clear, right? Like they kept on investing. They raised the gobs of money, hundreds of, I think, you sure you can correct me here in your in your post editing here. Um, I don't know, like three hundred million dollars, probably. Is that right? Well, um, yeah, they burned a lot. Of, <laughs> they, burned, they burned a lot of yeah. in, in the process. And um, Jonathan, sort of like looking towards the future now. One of your, I mean, you've come up with a number of frameworks about how to think about companies in the world. And one of them I really loved when reading about the Ship Rocket essay on your website was this idea of units of atomic value, and sort of about this idea that is um, a lot of ways that you can actually unleash value into the world when you sort of destroy barriers. And the example that you gave in this essay was the idea of the sort of um, Indian sort of e-commerce entrepreneur about all this value that is waiting to be unleashed, but there's these structural sort of inefficiencies. Um, in the market. So I'd love to get your sort of thoughts about um, go, going into the future now, what are some of those units of atomic value that you're really sort of interested in right now, or that you think may sort of be changing the world or changing certain nations? Yeah, so yeah, so I guess, you know, let me give you some of the lineage of that, right? So the, the lineage of this is that when you go back to the social web, there, you know, prior to the social, so the social web was kind of where, where we had this idea of like eyeballs, audience is all that matters. If you have a lot of engaged users, even if I don't make a dollar out of them, it's very valuable. 
And then markets sort of ended up rewarding that to some extent, right? Which is part of how Facebook was able to raise so far ahead of its actual revenue because right? People were giving them credit for engagement, right? And engagement was kind of the first nugget of a unit of value that's different from just raw revenue or profits, right? The idea that somehow having captured some attention um, is going to be in and of itself valuable. So that was that was kind of the beginning of it. In the, in the last sort of 10 years, 10, 15 years since sort of that story played out, obviously there have been other versions of that, right? Um, you know, there was sort of the, the, this idea of like, gig workers and like the hour of the gig workers time, right? That was one thing. There was there was this era of like um, compute power, right? That's kind of what crypto is. Maybe the unit of value is the ability to, you know, have, you know, to, to have something that enables you to exercise some compute on Ethereum or something. Maybe that's a unit of value, right? There was, there was and continues to be discussion about the idea of, you know, personal data as a unit of value. I have personal data. I use it on the internet. Right now, I don't capture any of that value. Maybe there's some way to capture that unit of value somehow using some sort of setup. And I think that there are all these sorts of, you know, different potential things out there. Clearly, we're in, we're in AI land right now. So maybe it's a unit of training data. I'm not sure. Maybe. Who knows, right? Um, and I think that, you know, from my point of view, from our point of view as investors, we're actually interested in hearing all the stories, right? Like, what's the thesis? And then show me. Can you get people to use it, right? It's one thing to claim that this is a unit of value. Like in the case of Facebook, it's one thing to claim that whatever units of engagement, you know, is a thing of value, but it's another thing to have hundreds of millions of users using you <laughs> and then proving it. Oh, there you go. Now it's real, right? And I think that's the Delta, you know, and the privacy is a great example where, where you know, there, there are a lot of companies working on it. We haven't yet seen any that we like love in terms of like companies where it's like an unusual pattern of growth that's able to exploit or maybe not exploit, but able to to somehow realize the value inside that privacy, that granular um, uh, privacy data, right? Nobody's really done that. In the case of Shiprocket, you talked about it, the, the transactions, right? The underlying, you know, the transactional information and the way that it moves through the e-commerce and shipping ecosystem in India is really different from how it operates here in the U.S. In the U.S., it's like, you know, you interact with a Shopify merchant, and then the transaction is handled sort of via payment rails on Shopify or something that's attached to your e-commerce website. And then the fulfillment is carried out by these large, you know, national level FedEx or whatever UPS. And so there's already sort of an infrastructure that moves the value around. But in India, that infrastructure looks totally different, <laughs> right? And that's kind of the thing. And then, and then the idea was, oh, Oh, Shiprocket is actually kind of refactoring parts of it and is able to capture a bunch of the value in that unit, in that atomic unit, right? So the atomic unit is the same in both cases, in the case of like the American e-commerce and the Indian e-commerce, but Shiprocket's ability to capture it is something that's a bit unique to their ecosystem. Does that make yeah. sense? That, that's super interesting. And that's, yeah, that's a really good example of Shiprocket. Um, I think we're going to go into the quick fires now. So Jonathan, something we like to do at the end of every episode is that we do a few quick fire rounds and we're just going to fire off a few questions and you're going to have 30 seconds to answer each one. Um, are you ready for that at all? I don't expect you to be ready. <laughs> Let's go for it. <laughs> Let's go for it. Cool. So what's one of your favorite books and why? Uh, my favorite book of the last 10 years, 15 years, uh, was The Origins of Political Order by Francis Fukuyama. Um, he is a political scientist at Stanford. Um, I, th I thought that book was really fantastic. It helped me to see sort of what he talks about is sort of the whole history of, it's actually the first part of two volumes. The second volume is about political decay after the French Revolution. Uh, but what he writes there is really a history of uh, how humans organize themselves into societies and all the different ways that humans have organized themselves. When you tend to be an economics oriented person, you tend to think of everything in terms of economics, you know, sort of economic systems and such. And that is an important part of the story, but, you know, he gives this other side of the story, sort of <laughs> the story of ideas, the story of how, yeah, you know, how, how, how ancient civilizations as well as, you know, pre, you know, sort of civilizations that didn't have the full economic infrastructure, how they decided to organize themselves and, and compare and contrast what that looks like, which, I, which was very meaningful for me, um, you know, as I was earlier in learning that stuff. Well, was that the book where you sort of famously coined that democracy was the end game and we're all going to live in these? Like, no, that was a, this was after that. Oh, okay. you're referring to yeah, yeah, the end of history and last name, which is a fantastic book, by the way. People malign it, but then most people never actually read it. Yeah, yeah. It's one <laughs> of those um, catchy terms to use. Um, what's one of your favorite podcasts and why? I don't listen to podcasts. Sorry. None at all? Literally none. What, what about newsletter <laughs> or blogs? We can um, sort of tailor that answer. Oh, okay. Um, I read John Authors in Bloomberg, um, okay. his macroeconomic one. It's really good because, uh, you know, 
he's kind of data oriented and I'm, I'm very interested in those macro things. Um, I think, uh, as a, I don't read as much on the startup side. I get that more from internal emails that we send internally to get a pulse on what's going on sort of in the, in the venture ecosystem. Um, but I've never, just never been a big podcast guy. I don't know. Fair I, enough. I read books. Yeah. So you can start now <laughs> with our podcast. Um, if you could have one guest over for dinner, they could be living or dead. Um, who would you want to have over? I think Henry Kissinger. Why is that? Well, because like he, he was there, you know, at front row for all these crazy things. Some of the most important things that happened in the last, however many, 50 years, more than that, I guess, 60, 70 years. And he was influential in helping them come about. I've also read many of his books and he's just an intellectual giant and just, uh, you know, sort of, that would be amazing to be a part of. Incidentally, I saw him once on the Excella from uh, New York to Philadelphia in like the first class Excel train. He was like on the phone and I was with my partner, Ted. And I was like, oh my goodness, that, that's Henry Kissinger. But he was like on the phone and I was, I was, you know, too, too like shy to say hi. And I kind of regret it. I kind of wish I'd been like a big fan. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's one of your favorite hobbies that's not jazz music? That's not jazz? Yeah. <laughs> Already mentioned it. Uh, um, I don't know. I cook a lot. That's pretty good. I'm I'm starting a winery with my wife in Sonoma. That's fun. <laughs> Just casually. <laughs> that's um that, that's one of the coolest answers we've heard. Um, what's one of your if you could only get one metric from a company, what would it be? Yeah, I mean, for for what purpose, I suppose. <laughs> from from a from a assessing kind of um how good this company is. One number, I mean, it would have to be a revenue scale. Cool. Yeah, I thought I thought you'd say that. Um, how would your best friend describe you? I don't know. Intellectually overbearing. <laughs> <laughs> and talks and, too much. <laughs> and Jonathan, if you could send everyone in the world a text message right now, what would it say? Um like one way or am I asking for feedback from them? The one way. One way? I don't know. I, I, I hope you're having a wonderful day. People need to be happy, you know? It's only one thing I'm going to say to them. Hope you're having a good day, probably. Yeah, love yeah, that. That's, that's a good one. That's beautiful. Um, this this was an awesome episode. We um we covered a lot of ground. And um, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. That was awesome. <laughs>